Um, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Jill Griffin and I'm Director of Workforce, Supplier and Diversity for the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. Welcome to our first webinar, Managing Cash Flow During Crisis. Um, earlier this year, we partnered with LEAF, Local Enterprise Assistance Fund, um, to offer technical assistance to rapidly growing small businesses that were providing goods and services to the casino and the horse racing um, industry. As um, many of you had to do, um, LEAF pivoted to offer virtual group assistance through webinars and remote one-on-one -on -one business counseling um, through our grant. Um, before I introduce our featured speaker, I'd actually like to um, turn it over to Commissioner Bruce Stebbins, um, the Massachusetts Gaming Commission, to kick us off. Great, thank you, Jill. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. On behalf of the team at the Massachusetts Gaming Commission and my fellow commissioners, uh, I want to thank you for joining us this morning. Obviously, these are unprecedented times, and please know that you, your employees, and your families are in our thoughts, and we hope everyone remains safe. It's, uh, it's great to have so many of you joining us today. Uh, I want to simply thank our MGC team of Jill Griffin, Crystal Howard, Elaine Driscoll, uh, Shara Badar, Tanya Perez, and Austin Bumpus for their work in pulling this webinar together with our partners at LEAF. Uh, we're very excited about this partnership. LEAF has over 30 years of experience in investing money and leveraging uh, financial resources that has helped them uh, be part of the creation of more than 10,000 jobs. Um, Obviously, uh, if you're a company that was doing business with a gaming licensee or you're a company seeking a business opportunity with them when they reopen, uh, I'm certain that this webinar will be helpful. And uh, we certainly invite your comments or feedback at any time by using our uh, contact page at massgaming.com or you can email us at mgccomments at massgaming.com. So thank you very much, Jill. Um, thanks. To all of you for joining us and I will turn it back over to you. Great and then our featured speaker Amin Benali, Managing Director of Strategy and Development for LEAF. Um, Amin has um, experience in financial analysis with uh, uh, investment management. He joined LEAF after 19 years as an investment analyst and portfolio manager um, focusing on emerging markets. He's also a professor at Northeastern University, uh, focusing on entrepreneurship and social finance. He has a BA in finance um, from Northeastern University and a uh, master's in economics from Boston University. I'd like to turn it over to Amin Benali. Thank you, Amin. Yeah, um, thank you, Jill. Um, thank you, Commissioner Stebbin, and thank you to the entire team at the MCC for the opportunity to partner with you um, um, for the crisis and certainly during the crisis. And, um, you know, we hope to be of help and service to you and to the businesses um, um, that are affected. Um, uh, you know, we have uh, we have a presentation, we have several slides to go through, and um, I will go through some fast, some slow and encourage everyone to uh, participate uh, via the chat room if you have questions or comments. Um, and um, I would address them and I'm sure we'll open the presentation um, after, after the slides for Q&A and happy to, uh, to go into detail at that point. Um, very briefly, um, you know, as Jill mentioned, LEAF is a CDFI, Community Development Financial Institution. Specifically, it's a loan fund. Um, it's been providing financings and development assistance to small businesses since 1983. Um, uh, so Jill was kind enough to go through my background, so I want to go through that. And um, the agenda that we have today is we want to briefly describe the economic context that, that we're going through at the moment. Um, everybody knows we're in contraction, everybody feels it, and uh, we'll just want to set the stage for a discussion around um, how to manage the business finances during the contraction. And then we'll pull in a case study. Uh, sometimes it's useful to give a real example. Um, this is not um, a real life example, but it is 
uh, collection of the experiences that we have gone through over the last several weeks and we put them into a hypothetical example still coming from the real world and then we want to talk about the post-crisis environment this is going to pass um, we're going to come out of this it's good to see the establishments um, speak about reopening the economy and uh, and, and it's good to um, keep an eye on the pre-opening phase and what happens after that so briefly on the economic context, um, you know, we are going through a contraction. Typically, the way things happen is the economy expands, we get to a peak performance, and then um, for a number of reasons that generally are internal to the economy, um, it begins to contract. Um, the growth slows down. Um, sometimes that's driven by um, the inability to find labor, wages are too high, sometimes inflation get out of hand. A number of things happen that cause the economy to begin to contract, and that's the left-hand side of that graph you're seeing there, that's a contraction. And then we hit a trough for bottom, and then we start to recover from that, and after we recover to the previous peak, we get into a prosperity phase. And then we hit that, that plateau again, and the economy slows down, and the cycle continues, it's normal. Um, there is nothing unusual about contractions. Um, there is something slightly unusual about the, the current um, experience. Um, if you look at this slide here, this is the economy since 2009. Remember 2009, that was the great financial crisis. And you know we have had about 10 to 11 years of expansion, pretty solid e economy. And generally those cycles last anywhere between four to six years. So 10, 11 years um, you know, is, is, is a long time. And I think the majority of the people were expecting some kind of slowdown. I mean, certainly we were not expecting um, a shock or a pandemic to cause it the way it did. But, but that being said, um, it was in the cards and it's been accelerated. So the, uh, you know, what we're looking at here is you know, some uncertainty about the recovery, <clears throat> how deep this recession is going to go, how long it'll last. We don't really have a lot of insight into that. And, and this month and next month, certainly with the companies reporting their earnings, we'll have better clarity and, and we'll be able to understand better. But one thing is clear is, um, you know, this is going to pass and um, businesses definitely need to keep an eye on that recovery and what happens post the crisis. Um, the playbook doesn't change. Um, uh, managing during the contraction is the same. Um, this time around, though, they, we just need to accelerate, and businesses have had the fortune to accelerate a lot of the adjustments that they needed to make. So, how do you manage your finances during the contraction? Um, there are two parallel paths most companies have to take. Um, the left hand side deals with preservation and stability of the business. Um, generally, that takes about 90% to 100% of the time of business managers, entrepreneurs. Um, you know, at this time, you're concerned about cash, you're concerned about, you, you know, clients are canceling orders, etc. So there is a lot happening and there's a lot of crisis management. That being said, um, crises also create opportunities. And to the extent that companies have been reviewing their strategies pre the crisis, they need to be able to allocate some time um, during um, the, the crisis management to also be thinking about and, and we'll go through some of that as well. So, um, so two parallel paths. We spend probably the majority of the time talking about preservation and stability because that matters a lot more right now. But we want to make sure that we save some time to talk about the strategy for the future. <coughs> Excuse me. So contraction versus expansion. And here we are talking about the economies. Um, you know, during the contraction, you know, generally preserving cash is a priority. Um, it should be a priority at all times, but during the contraction, it is much more vital um, because it can create existential challenges when it's not there. So what that means is, you know, you need to look at your balance sheet. Every business owner has to look at the balance sheet. If they haven't in the past, then that should become part of the norm that that's something they, they review frequently. And as you're reviewing your balance sheet, you also need to be looking at your operations and what generates cash flow for you and rebuilding your budgets, constantly reviewing them and doing scenario analysis um, so that you can, um, you, you want to be on top of what's happening um, with your operations and what's contributing to cash drain and what's adding to cash to your business. Still, your balance sheet is your key uh, statement uh, at, at this point for analysis. So what's in your balance sheet? Um, you know, very clearly on, on the left-hand side, you have your assets. So that's what allows you to produce. So that's your cash, that's your accounts receivable, invoices that you haven't collected, your inventory, uh, unsold products, uh, unfinished products, 
your equipment, your machinery, um, your office space, whatever it is. These are the things that are tying up your cash. They allow you to produce products that you can sell. But at the same time, until you sell them, they are not cash. They are an asset, but they're not cash. So you want to pay attention to those and you want to minimize those as much as possible. On the right-hand side, you have the capital that paid for those assets. So you have debt or equity. Equity is what you brought into the business. And these are the obligations, financial obligations, that can reduce your cash. So your accounts payable is what you owe to your vendors. And so to the extent that you have to pay, that, that, that takes away cash from your balance sheet. Your bank loans, your lines of credit, alternative lenders, any sort of loan that you have or financial obligation, um, these are your obligations to pay, which means they, they affect your cash in a negative way. So what we're going to go through in this section right now is, you know, this preservation and stability. What, what are the steps that you need to take? And the steps we're highlighting here, we'll go through some, you know, you, obviously reviewing the loans and contacting lenders. That needs to happen in order to give you some background around that. What we call cash conversion cycles. And it's just a fancy word for saying, um, you know, when you're looking at your accounts receivable, you want to accelerate receipt of those payments to the extent possible and your clients are able to. And when you're looking at your payables, you want to prioritize how, who you're paying and how you're paying. And, 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 and we'll go through some of that as well. Inventory is something that, um, that also, um, depending on how fast you can sell it, it can generate cash for you. So anything that can convert into cash, you want to reduce the cycle of that conversion. You know, asset sales will go through that as well. And then I added an item that has come up a lot in conversation with some of the businesses over the last four year, uh, four weeks especially, and that is reviewing your uh, business interruption insurance. And um, you know, in, in most, in, in a lot of instances, um, that item was not covered in most policies. But it is something worth reviewing. There is really no downside to asking about that item because you know, if, if in fact it was there, then it could be very beneficial. You know, all of this, uh, you know, with the spirit of keeping an eye on a balance sheet. So we'll go through the, first, um, the three uh, points in a little bit more detail. You know, you re your, your, review your existing financial facilities or financing facilities to make sure you understand how they can change as a result of this crisis. Um, to the extent you have loan documents, you want to review them. You want to check your covenants. Covenants are events that can trigger action and review. Sometimes, for instance, some lenders require businesses to maintain um, profitability or profits that are um, two times <clears throat> the amount of their debt service in terms of interest and principal. So we are going into an environment where business activity has slowed, where we're looking at lower profits, potentially losses. So you want to see how those affects your loans and your obligations and, and going through your, your, your loan documents um, is, is, is critical at this point. You want to ensure that your lines of credit and your other facilities remain in place. Um, liquidity is key, and liquidity isn't only cash that's, that you own in your balance sheet. Liquidity is also what you can access in terms of financing from financial institutions. Um, as a result of that, you want to keep communication with your lenders, and um, you know, as needed, you want to discuss loan modifications. What we have experienced over the last four weeks is several businesses that were very hesitant to contact their lenders. And if they did, <clears throat> it was within the context of asking about relief programs like the um, uh, Paycheck Protection Program and EIDL. Um, and they were, um, there, there was so much this, uh, this nervousness about speaking about the business in a negative way because the feeling was that it would affect how the lenders view them. Um, you know, the, I can assure you that lenders want to hear from their clients and their borrowers especially um, uh, going through this crisis. It is expected that most businesses you know, are facing some kind of financial challenges. In the past, uh, it is possible that some of the lenders may not have wanted to have um, loans that were challenged in their, in their portfolios. Um, they are regulated, and so they are beholden to certain standards as well of quality in their portfolios. However, um, about three weeks ago, the Federal Reserve issued guidance for the lenders and the Federal Reserve regulates the banks and the, and the financial institutions. And so, uh, and this is quoting specifically from, from their guidance memo, the agencies view loan modifications um, as positive actions that can mitigate adverse effects on borrowers due to COVID-19. The agencies will not criticize institutions for working with borrowers and will not direct supervised institutions to automatically categorize all COVID-19 related loan modifications as troubled debt restructurings or TDRs. 
TDRs are something that lenders want to minimize. So in this particular case, what the Federal Reserve is saying is, go ahead and, and, and make accommodations to your borrowers, and that will not count against you. In fact, it will be viewed as a positive action. So keep that in mind. There is really no reason to, um, to not want to contact your borrower if there were any concerns about how they would view your business. Um, you know, uh, the opposite is in fact true, and it is true by guidance from the, from the uh, federal regulators on this. <coughs> in terms of cash conversion cycles, um, you know, the key elements here are accounts receivable and accounts payable. Um, accounts receivable generally is an item that um, a lot of business owners don't don't pay a lot of attention to during expansion. You know, business is growing, um, you know, sales are happening, the client book is growing fast, and you know, and you have a few clients that may not be paying on time, or maybe instead of um, 30 days, you're at 90 days. You have to follow through with them. It's a lot of work to follow up with them, and it takes very little of your bandwidth. Um, you know, so, uh, and sometimes it can, it can get neglected. Um, this is the time to go back to your accounts receivable to your clients and get a sense of when you could receive some payments. Uh, you might be dealing with some service aggregators, some very large, um, clients, um, that have already announced that they are step, uh, they've stopped all payments. Uh, make sure you contact them and see, you know, how that policy might affect you. If there are any exceptions with respect to the service that you provide you know, see if you can offer some discounts for early repayments to the extent you're able to. Um, you know, in that case, you're essentially financing your clients so that they pay you early. And, um, you know, and, and, and the, the, the idea here is uh, if your business requires it, you are accelerating um, the receipt of cash and the conversion of those invoices into actual cash. You know, factoring is an option. It may not work for every business, um, especially at this time, and it has a cost to it. It's not cheap. But it's also something that, that should be considered, and there are factoring agencies that look at receivables and, you know, and, 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 and would make proposals for how they would handle them and, and what you get for them. Um, accounts payable is another important item uh, in the balance sheet. These are invoices that you owe, um, services that were um, rendered to you, and, and, and products and parts that were supplied to you, and you have to make payments on them. And this is probably time where you need to see uh, what the terms are. Um, what the aging of those receivables looks like, and then begin to prioritize your payments to the extent you you have to when you need to, and 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 these are some 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 frank reviews that and that need to happen, and and everybody's going through this, so your clients are doing exactly the same thing, um, as you would be expected to do with your vendors. So call your vendors um, if needed, negotiate payment plans as needed. Um, and, and um, you know, and see if they can offer a discount for you to pay early to the extent your, your liquidity position allows you to do that. But these are um, the, some of the ways in which companies have been dealing with their, with their accounts payable uh, um, of all sorts over the last several weeks. Um, asset sales, um, a lot of companies accumulate assets over time and some of those assets um, became um, non-core or, or not essential, um, especially if some companies had um, a truck of fleets and they upgraded and they kept the old fleet in case, um, you know, as backup, et cetera, and they were planning to sell those assets anyway, um, so they were redundant, um, you know, are they needed, do we need to accelerate the process of sale, et cetera. Um, that's something that, um, you know, that, that, that maybe you should accelerate to the extent you're able to and can. And again, all of this is with the idea, um, and every business is, is different and every situation is different, but depending on the cash need and the critical need for that cash, um, it might require some of these actions. Um, some of them could include um, um, asset sales and leaseback. Um, this is probably a much more dramatic um, course of action to take and, and may not be ideal for everyone. Um, but it is something to review, and all of this really depends on the severity of the liquidity crunch that the companies um, could be facing. Um, so these are the, the, the main highlights from the balance sheet. Um, balance sheet affects your cash um, in, in, in different ways, um, uh, as in sometimes it ties up your cash and sometimes it slows the, the, the pace at which cash comes into your balance sheet. So you need to be able to review that and, and remove any friction in that conversion process. Your operations and your sales and expenses, um, that's also where a lot of the adjustments, uh, the adjustments have been happening. 
Um, so reviewing your cost structure, and I know most businesses have been doing that and have been forced into doing that because, um, you know, if you're carrying um, a high um, labor payroll um, business, then you really have to, you, you have been reviewing it and, and making adjustments as needed. And we'll go through some of the items here, um, including looking at your cost, fixed and variable, um, staffing decisions. Um, we we'll give you kind of some of our own experience with this. Um, some alternative revenue sources. Companies have been very creative in coming up with ways in which they can they can sell and provide the services and products and, and receive payments for them. And again, building scenarios is critical. Um, you know, most companies have budgets that they go through every two weeks or every four weeks. And, um, you know, this is one of those times where, you know, those scenarios have been, those budgets have been, need to be adjusted much more frequently. So in terms of your cost structure, um, every business has variable costs and fixed costs. Um, you know, your variable costs will adjust with your business if you're selling more. Um, you're using more labor, you're producing more, you're, you're using more parts, you're delivering more, you're paying more for fuel, for tolls. Um, you know, those are costs that are variable, you know, production, labor, delivery, supplies. Um, uh, if you share a commercial space where you have to pay by the, by the use hour, you know, that's a, that's a variable cost. And those are very frustrating costs when times are good because, you know, your sales are going up and in, in the right hand chart there, you see the blue line, that's your sales. And then the red line, that's your variable cost. And, you know, it seems frustrating because no matter how much you grow, your costs are growing with you. And so the green sliver, which is your profit, always seems to be, you know, it's, you know, you, you won't be able to, to, to um, um, expand it as you grow. Um, you know, so those are, uh, those are frustrating during the good times, but then during the time, bad times, they are your friends because as your sales and your business activity uh, slows down and that's the, the blue line in the chart, these variable costs will come down as well, right? So ensuring that, um, you maintain some level of profitability, right? So you're using maybe less production labor, less delivery labor, you know, less supplies, um, less, uh, shared operations time. And all of that contributes to your costs coming down as your sales are coming down, and, and these become your friends. Um, you know, you <coughs> you also have fixed costs in your business, and these are costs that you have to pay whether you produce one item, the million items, or no items. Um, that's rent, you know, some utilities, insurance, you know, admin expenses. These have nothing to do with your actual operations. Um, they maintain your business whether your volume doubles, triples, or halves, or goes away completely. And so they are usually your friend during the, the good times uh, in that your sales are growing. That's the, the blue line, but the red line, which is your fixed cost, is not growing. And so you're, you're benefiting from that top line growth. It's all flowing to the profit line. But when uh, contraction happens and business slow down and your sales begin to trend lower and your fixed costs are not changing, then you know that that buffer that you you had begins to shrink, and that's something you want to pay attention to. And um, you know most businesses that we work with, we go through their um, line items on their income statement and your oper and their operations and budgets, and categorize them in terms of fixed and variable, so that they have a better sense of how they will uh, what they will incur in terms of expenses and cash outlays in the next six months. In terms of rent and lease, uh, we get this question a lot. What do I do about that? It's usually a fixed, a significant cost for many businesses. And, um, you know, so we're not, we don't have legal expertise. So, you know, I, I, we, we're not going to make recommendations. You know, I know some people say don't pay your rent or lease. Some people, people approach it differently. Um, our experience, just from having spoken with several businesses that have had to deal with this, clearly, Initiating a conversation with the landlord is critical. I mean, you have to talk to them. Um, second, um, <clears throat> what we have seen is landlords have been able to accommodate um, their tenants, you know, because, you know, obviously they don't want to have um, empty buildings coming out of the crisis. And um, every business that is saved uh, uh, during this crisis is a business that will come back and continue to be a tenant. So they've been able to work with the businesses um, some of them have deferred all payments. 
some of them have said, look, you know, I still have to pay mortgage on, on this property and therefore pay me just this much and then, um, then we'll work out the rest, et cetera. So this has been um, case by case and, and it's something that clearly we, we encourage everyone to speak with the landlords about. But, you know, you are not the only business that's experiencing this, um, if you are. Um, I just put in on the right-hand side a clip from the Wall Street Journal that came out this morning that said that, that Tesla is also seeking rent savings from, um, you know, from their landlord, uh, landlords um, because of the crisis. So every business is reviewing that, that, that cost item, and it tends to be a fairly significant um, uh, line item in, in every uh, business uh, income statement. Another question we get a lot is staffing decisions. Um, it's been about four weeks since all of this has uh, um, um, started. And so <laughs> businesses have already had to make some difficult adjustments. Um, you know, but that being said, you know, we know that workers are critical to business. Um, they are probably the single, single most valuable asset. Um, rehiring and training takes time and is very expensive. Um, you know, so uh, we work with some businesses where um, the, 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 the service provision relies on technicians to go on site. And so uh, without technicians, um, the business will be able to, uh, to, to handle uh, the, the service requests. And when for some of the business we worked with, um, it took you know, somewhere between you know, eight or, or um, four to eight months to find the right technicians and experts and employees and hire them. And they don't want to go through that process again. So most companies are keeping their key personnel, the ones that they're not able to keep. I mean, they're helping um, through, um, um, you know, through their support with, uh, with unemployment, et cetera. So, um, so there is support out there, um, you know, but these are some of the um, experiences that we have seen. Companies have been adjusting hours. Um, for all employees, for low end employees, and you know the, the the paycheck protection program is designed to maintain staffing, and so that pre that provides uh, some relief for businesses that feel as though you know they need to maintain um, their their staff and and the revenue isn't there to do that. So that's something that's um, that that most companies are looking at very carefully, um, especially the ones that feel that they they need to maintain a large number of their staff. Um, alternative revenue sources, um, this is really case by case, depending on the product, depending on the service, depending on the industry, uh, we can't capture in the industry, but uh, and some of the points here, you know, you've, you've seen already in terms of food service companies finding alternative outlets, um, the critical institutions still require um, food service, hospitals, healthcare facilities, etc. So that's that created a good channel for some businesses. Um, exploring different pricing structures to incentivize clients to stay. Um, you know, so some equipment sellers, for example, um, did not offer buyback options to clients, and now they're doing it. And even though it's not material to the client's cash flow at the moment or the buyer, but just knowing that there's a buyback option um, keeps them involved. And, and we've seen that especially from a lot of equipment manufacturers and car dealers. Alternative service delivery mechanism, you know, so if your business is, um, is, is a knowledge-based based business, so whether it's consulting, training, education, the, the, the online platforms that have, um, that have developed over the last several weeks clearly offer a way for, for some service and, and revenue continuity. Um, revise your budget. Um, you know, there, this is something that should happen anyway at least once a month. Um, now probably happens a lot more times during one week. Um, order cancellations uh, have, have already um, um, uh, taken hold, service interruptions, um, staffing adjustments that you're making, those affect your budget. Uh, workouts and accommodations with your creditors, those affect how much you have to pay for your debt service. Other sources of sales and cash, including the relief programs. So build different scenarios. And, um, and, and all of this is to make, uh, means that you have to be much more on top of your operations, but also closer to your clients to understand what their circumstances are and how they see the world. Are we talking about um, getting back to some normal baseline by the middle of the summer, by in the fall, next year, much earlier than that? These are things that you can only get a handle on with conversations with your clients. So what we want to do is go through an example because sometimes um, it's easier to go through a practical case. 
And here we have an industrial services company um, as an example, um, and um, they've experienced um, service interruptions or suspensions in mid-March where probably about 50% of their clients essentially said that they are not going to um, take on the service anymore and don't expect to come back until mid-summer. So sometime July is when they expect to come back. And even since from there, it'll probably take you know three to six months for them to get to where they were in terms of business level um, before the crisis. Now, all of this is hypothetical, right? But it's, it's, been, it's informed by um, actual experiences that we have witnessed over the last four weeks. So the business has had to make some adjustments in terms of staffing, um, you know, so uh, truck drivers, for example, you know, less routes, um, less delivery. So a lot of adjustments happened there. Um, they were able to cut some costs where possible in terms of marketing, administration, general, they were able to make some adjustments there. And like every business um, in the country, they, they also are looking to benefit from some of these programs, the Paycheck Protection Program and the uh, Economic Injury Disaster Loan. So let's go through <coughs> some of the numbers. And, and we'll make that probably one of the last um, uh, points that we bring during the, this, uh, this presentation. So here, these are some of the projections we helped them put together in February. So this is before the crisis really um, took on the scale that it took in, in, in March. You know, they were looking at existing sales at about one and a half million dollars. You, um, you know, you throw in some direct labor, some other costs of production and sales. Um, and then you get to gross profit or income of about nine hundred and thirteen, nine hundred and fourteen thousand dollars. And then, you know, you move down to some of the operating expenses, you know, SGNA payroll, which is a selling general and administrative payroll by three hundred ninety thousand. Their rent and lease, you know, so which is still significant, the insurance payments, um, some other expenses. All in all, um, the business was looking at um, a, in a profit for 2020 at about $280,000 after everybody's been paid. And, you know, that's, a, you know, kind of a healthy margin for a business like this in this particular industry. So here we are again at the end of March, having had conversations with, uh, with their clients. And um, they realized that based on what they saw and they put in their budgets, um, sales for the year would go down from $1.5 million to $800,000, right? So a pretty significant drop in, in, in sales. If nothing were to change, right? So if nothing changes, um, and that's the column that we have on the far right, then they would have been looking at a loss of negative $435,000, which would have been catastrophic for this business. Uh, they just weren't enough reserves to be able to sustain something like that, right? But this is unrealistic, right? This is, we, you can't expect that there would not be any adjustments. And what we're gonna do is keep track of some of the changes in the right-hand side chart that we have there. So we have initial expected loss without any changes, and that's the red bar, negative $436,000. Luckily for this business, they were able to find some alternative sources of revenues um, that they expect will get them $125,000, right? So that already begin to chip away at that loss. And that's kind of the, the blue bar that you're seeing there. Um, it's just kind of adding incrementally, adding about $125,000 so that the loss now has been reduced from four hundred thirty-five to about $300,000. Um, this business this is heavy on direct labor and um, direct cost of sales. And so they were able to um, make some staffing adjustments on direct labor that saved them about 138,000 for the year. Um, able to see some other um, cost adjustments um, for, the, for direct production and sales of 230. Um, and, you know, so now you can see we're chipping away at the potential loss pretty aggressively, right? So there is, it's, it's reduced in that, that the potential loss by a significant amount. And they were able to make some adjustments to um, um, general administrative expenses, uh, rent, they didn't change, you know, some changes to insurance, uh, largely due to how they manage their fleet. Um, and then some other expense adjustments that they made, you know, all in all, um, you know, they've been able to reduce the potential loss from uh, and take it from a loss of $436,000 to a loss of $26,000, which is, which is not unbearable. Right, so it's something that they can manage, especially if you consider that they'll be able to receive some of that um, um, relief program funding um, from the payroll protection program or EIDL. Then it would allow them to come out of this year, you know, with with a positive cash position, not a negative cash position, and and that kind of goes into preservation and the stability theme that we have talked about. 
So, um, and, and this is something that we have <coughs> helped um, businesses with and, 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 you know, and we continue to help businesses develop so that they can have a better uh, and a clearer understanding of what they need to do um, to preserve cash and to come out this year with, with a healthy um, cash position. Um, shifting gear a little bit, uh, we have to be thinking about the post-crisis environment and we're only dedicating a small amount of time. This is a whole theme by itself and maybe eventually we'll, we'll be able to develop that um, uh, in, into its own presentation. You know, but um, you know, it, this crisis will cause some dislocations. I mean, it, it'll, it'll have some, some impact that will last for more than just a few months. It'll last for a long time. So some suppliers you know, may not come back from this for a lot of reasons. Some of them intrinsic, um, they just decided, you know what, this is, this is time for me to go, um, or some other reasons, but you know, it could cause disruptions to your supply chain, uh, where you get your services, where you get your, your equipment, your parts, and, and something you wanna look at because as you're looking at how you manage your business post the crisis, your supply chain is important. You know, some clients may not come back and, and, and that it will affect your market and your, um, and your business book. Um, uh, you know, some, uh, some of the pricing and the revenue models will change. Um, you know, some of your pricing schedules will change and, and you want to be able to anticipate some of that and plan for it and plan for it in a way where, you know, you're not surprised, but you're able to adjust your business so that it doesn't take away from your ability to, to make a profit. The labor market will change. Um, you know, because there are big dislocations. Companies are working very hard to keep their staff. And if they can't, they want to make sure that they keep in touch with them um, so that um, when, um, when this thing passes and we're reopening, that they have, they will still be able to get them to come back and, and provide the work for them. And that's very important. And then importantly, some competitors might not return. Um, some of the companies that you compete with might not return and some will be even stronger depending on how they manage during the crisis. And so these are things that you wanna keep in mind <coughs> going forward. And that goes into your strategy. Um, if you didn't have a strategic plan before, it's probably a good time to start thinking about what sort of company and scale you wanna have going forward. And um, you know, so strategic planning, um, very important. Um, can you integrate some functions into your business? Uh, which means can you buy some of these businesses um, at the same time, saving the businesses, but making sure that there is continuity for your own activities. Um, are there any roll-up opportunities out there, competitors that are willing to, or, or have been thinking about exiting, but now this have uh, accelerated that. Um, so can you begin to merge the industry a little bit? And you know, how about the capital? Can you access that capital? What are some of the strategies to, to get some of that capital to execute on this? The balance sheet also, uh, you could use this opportunity to, to enhance it. The interest rate environment will change. Um, they have been dropping very aggressively since March, uh, probably will stay low for a very long time. So there may be an opportunity to begin to restructure that balance sheet away from some aggressively high uh, interest rate loans um, that we have seen over the last several years. And, um, and so an opportunity to come out of this uh, with a much stronger balance sheet for your business. So um, I think, uh, yeah, and obviously explore your, all the relief programs. You know, you have the Paycheck Protection Program, the EIDL. There are several state and local programs that, um, that have been uh, proposed. There are some uh, companies that are offering grants um, and other lending, and we have listed several of those in our website. If you go to uh, leafund.org, and we have a banner for COVID-19 crisis response. And we have detailed a lot of this uh, material there as well for, for, your, for your help. Um, and that concludes the, the slide portion of the presentation. I'm happy to take uh, questions uh, from you guys, either in the chat room or I'm not sure um, if uh, Jill will un unmute um, the speakers, but if there are questions in, in the chat room, I will address them. Um, I will read them out and then address them. I think folks can unmute themselves by going in the lower left-hand corner of their screen and hover over the microphone. Jill, if you would like, I can unmute all for a moment. Sure, any questions for me?
All right. Hearing none, um, I mean, I'd like to thank you for your presentation and also mention um, consult the uh, Massachusetts Gaming Commission website as well for um, programs that we have um, compiled. Um, mathgaming.com. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Amin. Thank you.